Okay, guys, next up, um, we're going to do a kind of long-term career options panel. So we're going to have three uh, folks come up here and just kind of casually talk about their career path um, in emergency medicine, how they got where they are, uh, and again, um, ideally have some opportunity for questions and dialogue around this. Um, our uh, three speakers for this, uh, Dr. Jody Vogel, um, is actually the program director. What's your title, Jody? She's in charge of this meeting. So we can thank Jody for putting this together. Um, Jody and I work together at Denver Health, and she um, is a uh, very successful researcher, and so we'll speak to that. Uh, Dr. Nicole DeBosch um, uh, will be here as well, talking about kind of an education path uh, through emergency medicine. Uh, Dr. DeBosch is a uh, associate clerkship director at Harvard. And then Dr. Zach Giroux is uh, on his way. He just texted me. Um, Zach and I actually trained together at Denver Health. He's now an administrative fellow uh, at the University of Chicago. He was the past president of EMRA. Uh, you may be familiar with him. And he'll talk a little bit about kind of the admin operations side of things. So um, I will hand this over to our panel. If you guys just want to give an overview of... Um, who you are, how you got where you are, and we'll go from there. Thank you, Gannon, and thank you for your excellent work, uh, Gannon, and um, uh, organized this day. So uh, he's certainly responsible for the Medical Student Symposium and has done a great job. Um, so uh, as he indicated, uh, my name is Jody Vogel. I'm at the Denver Health Medical Center. Um, I did, completed medical school in Michigan and then went to Denver for training and then stayed on. My focus is primarily on research, so I'll give you a little bit of perspective on what a career in academic research uh, might look like in case that's of interest to you. Um, so for an academician who's primarily focused on research, the goal is to publish papers and secure grants. That's the primary goal, so a lot of uh, my time is spent working to create manuscripts for publication and also securing grant funding so that I can actually complete the research work itself. So by securing the grants, I can provide support for a biostatistician or someone to analyze my data. So if um, a mentee of mine is, has a great idea for a research project, we can then use those resources to help facilitate that person's success. So securing the grant in part is related to myself, but more importantly, it's related to other people. Um, and facilitating their success as well. In general, people in academia, uh, part of your promotion would include uh, an evaluation of publications. So even if you're not a researcher, if you have publications or even um, um, digital media that you have presented or distributed throughout ac the academic world, um, that's very important for your promotion. As a researcher, um, the primary focus, as I said, would be on manuscripts and grants. And at this time, it's, we, no one would expect that you would know exactly what you want to do. Uh, you may want to take advantage of opportunities to try research or try writing a paper, uh, working with your mentor. I know Dr. Cass was just here and spoke about mentorship. That would be a way to see if this is of interest to you. And often people say, well, I see so many successful people, and you know, how, does, how do they get to that point? In my opinion, the majority of successful people have found things that they enjoy doing because realistically, at the end of the day, some days you're going to be fatigued and maybe not want to work on things. But if it's something that you enjoy, then you don't have to compel yourself to do it. So if you're able to um, find enjoyment in it, it's much easier, and therefore it's much easier to be successful. And I would say that uh, just try to expose yourself to as many things as you can to see if they are right for you um, and find the thing that you would be willing to do even on the days when you're fatigued. Um, and if you find enjoyment in that, you'll be able to succeed in whatever you choose. And um, I'll take questions at the end, right, Gannon? Yeah, we'll have some questions as well. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Nicole Dubash. I'm a core faculty and one of our associate clerkship directors at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center in Boston. And my career trajectory is focused on medical education. So I actually went to medical school in Ohio. I came to Boston for residency at BIDMC 
decided that I really liked medical education. I wanted to pursue this as a career track in academics, so I stayed and completed a medical education fellowship at my institution. And then kind of all the stars aligned. I was in the right place at the right time when one of the clerkship directors was leaving, and I got offered this position right after fellowship. So I've been on faculty now for five years at BIDMC. Um, so my my career kind of consists of a couple different components. There's the clinical time. I work approximately 10 shifts per month at our academic center in one of our community hospitals. Um, a lot of the administrative and mentoring and student day-to-day -day aspects of running three medical student courses through our department, um, and then research in medical education. So when students, when students and residents come to me and ask about careers in medical education, I tell them there's a, there's a wide variety of what you can do. A lot of people, especially residents, kind of in their training, are really interested in teaching. People come and say, I love to teach. I want to go into medical education, um, which is great. There's a lot of ways you can do that. If you just want to teach, you love bedside teaching and working with trainees, a lot of community hospitals actually offer that because a lot of residency programs send their trainees out to different sites. And if you solely want that and you don't want any of the academic or administrative roles related to medical education, there are certainly venues for that in ways where you can see patients but also be able to interact with, with students and residents at the bedside. Um, kind of on the other extreme is the academic tract and promotional tract for a medical education career. And that certainly involves teaching at the bedside and other things like curriculum development, simulation, et cetera. But that also has a whole promotional tract, a little bit different than the traditional researcher promotion tract that Dr. Vogel was talking about. But you need to show scholarly activity if you're at an academic institution in order to get promoted in medical education. And that entails not only research, but also things like curriculum development, committee membership, administrative roles, and kind of telling your story as a medical educator. Um, so I love what I do. I think one of the things in emergency medicine, I would say we don't really have continuity of care with our patients, except for those few that come back every few days. Um, but for me, I really like being able to work with students and residents kind of over the long term. And I think of my students and residents as my continuity of care, per se, within emergency medicine. Um, I personally like the balance. I like the administrative roles. I like having that kind of longitudinal connection. And I like medical education research as well. So for me, that kind of fit. Um, so we'll open up to questions again at the end. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Zach Drew, and I am currently doing an administrative fellowship at uh, the University of Chicago, and I'm also doing a fellowship through the American College of Emergency Physicians uh, remotely. That's in administration, informatics, quality, and policy. Uh, I did my residency at Denver Health and uh, went to medical school at uh, Michigan State University. Um, I think the reason that I'm really interested in administration as I want to make working in the emergency department better for physicians and better for patients. And, um, you know, a lot of hospitals now are run by people who purely have, you know, business training and they've got a lot of ideas that look great on paper and on spreadsheets, but they've never really taken care of, uh, of patients before. And so one of the things that's really important to me is that we have physicians in leadership roles within hospitals and within health systems. Uh, my ultimate career goal is to be a chief innovation officer for an academic health system. Um, in addition to doing my fellowship, uh, I'm also getting my MBA right now from the University of Chicago. Uh, I think there's a lot of different options that are available for people who are sort of interested in uh, the administrative area. You can be a leader within your department, you can be a leader within a hospital, you can be a leader within a health system, and there's lots of other opportunities for folks to get involved with sort of the business of emergency medicine through like uh, revenue cycle management, through healthcare consulting, and so there's a ton of opportunities available in the space. I also uh, interviewed for informatics fellowships, uh, so if you guys have any questions about uh, informatics fellowships uh, during the question period, I'd be happy to answer those too. So 
let's go ahead. Let's go ahead and open it up to questions. If you guys have any questions for the panelists. I think this is more directed at Dr. Vogel. Um, two questions. Uh, when did you know that you wanted to dedicate your career to research? And the second one, is it possible to combine some opportunities for teaching with your research? Just because I imagine that keeps you very busy. Uh, yeah, no, that's a, those are both great questions. Um, so for me, I had exposure to research prior to medical school, just a single exposure. And I hadn't even really considered research prior to that, but really enjoyed that experience. And that compelled me to move forward with research. And as a medical student between the first and second year, I did a uh, mini research uh, fellowship at the Cleveland Clinic. I used that time to do a research project there. And from there on, just kept, kept moving forward with research. Um, so it was something that I really enjoyed, uh, which I thought was a key component in terms of making it a longer term plan. Um, and from the perspective of the diversity of research, the nice thing about research is you can investigate different areas. If you're interested in medical education, you can focus your research there. If you're interested in basic science, you can focus there. And there's also the opportunity for teaching, which is what your question was about. Both the people that you're working with, your colleagues, um, you know, other um, faculty members within the department. I'm working with other people now on projects, so there's an opportunity for me to learn from them and for us to share experiences, but also an opportunity to mentor students and residents in projects. And another component of research is, since you do have the grants, you do have time uh, to take time to do research with others, and you have um, available hours in addition to your clinical work to conduct the research. So that's a nice balance. You have some clinical time, some teaching time, and some research time, which makes for a really nice balance over the long term, in my opinion. But that obviously is something that I enjoy very much. So <laughs> does that answer your question? Thank you. Hello. Um, I have a question for everybody in the panel. A lot of uh, most of the med students here, I would hope, have career dreams, interests, thoughts on where they might want to take emergency medicine and down what pathways. But I'm doing my, my fourth year AI right now, and a lot of the physicians say some of those pathways can be a little bit more difficult than we anticipate. And so I'm wondering what dreams you guys had when you were thinking emergency medicine, and if you followed that to where you are now, or if it changed, and kind of how you navigated that. So is your question specific to just emergency medicine as a specialty or specific to the career paths and sort of the challenges associated with career paths or both? I would say both kind of emergency medicine at the base, but the kind of the tracks that you took away from that and how you've kind of navigated them together, I guess. Yeah, I think, um, I guess as far as emergency medicine as a specialty, one of the things that um, I don't think that I really appreciated as a, a student was uh, the amount of social problems and societal problems that end up sort of being magnified on your doorstep and how emergency physicians are, you know, really the front line of a lot of the, the worst things in society. I mean, you're on the front lines of gun violence and drug abuse and domestic violence and child abuse and elder abuse and seeing the, the long-term impacts of poverty and homelessness and just the forgotten, the forgotten people. And I think that in response to that, that sort of motivated me to want to explore options that health systems can take to treat those underlying social determinants of health and make a business case for treating those social determinants of health to try and keep people out of the emergency department for, for social issues so that they don't turn into to the medical issues that we're, that we're there to treat. And I think we have a unique privilege to be able to see all those people that most of society never interacts with. And, and I think we have a responsibility to do, to do something about it rather than just quickly you know, getting them through the, through the emergency department. Um, in terms of my sort of like career path, I, I had this big question of should I do administrative fellowships or should I do informatics fellowships? And um, 
you know, unique to those pathways. There's questions about is there a board certification option or not. Um, I have a, a, a big a background in sort of tech and all the informatics stuff sort of came easy to me, but for me I thought that having an MBA and sort of learning the you know, business skills and learning sort of mathematical approaches to, to make decisions under uncertainty um, would be sort of a more valuable skill set for me right now than getting the informatics specific training. So for me, I went into medical school not knowing what I wanted to do. At first I thought peds, and then I thought surgery, and then I thought internal medicine. And so when I went through my third year, um, we had the option to do an elective in emergency medicine my third year, and so I had done a bunch of my core clerkships, and when I got to that EM month, I realized this doesn't feel like work. I was excited to go in every day. You know, an eight-hour shift felt like I was only there for an hour and it was already time to go home. And this is what I tell students. It's tough. This is a huge decision deciding your specialty. And all of you can make all these spreadsheets about the pros and cons of everything, lifestyle, day-to-day -day work, compensation, job availability. But at the end of the day, this is a specialty. This is a job you're going to be in for about 30-plus years you want to do what you want to do and listen to your gut when you're there whatever rotation you're on does this feel like work and are you looking at the clock wanting to go home or are you excited to be there and are you interested and it feels like there's no other place in the hospital i'd rather be right now um, and really listen to that and that's for me that's what i realized aha like emergency medicine is my calling this feels right this is a good fit and this is what my gut is telling me to do and i went with that because i was very you know undifferentiated when i went into medical school and i've never regretted my decision i would not choose another specialty at this point in time um so during so from that um i kind of during residency and actually during medical school, I got involved in a medical education research project. So that was always teaching and education and curriculum development was always kind of on the back of my mind. Um, so I explored that option during residency and realized, you know, I want to be more involved with education than just bedside teaching. I want to work at an academic institution. I want to do my own research projects. I want to be involved at the medical school level more than just the bedside teaching. So I decided to do a medical education fellowship um, at my institution. And I think the landscape in medical education has changed over the past five to 10 years. Um, 10 years ago, people, the, the clerkship directors and the APDs were typically the, peop the junior faculty who were right out of training, love to teach, here you go. You're in charge of all the students. I think now a lot of these roles, um, a lot of chairs are looking for people who've had specialized training in medical education. Um, again, that's not an absolute. I have a good friend who's a clerkship director at a very well-known institution who had no training, was just applied for the job and got it. Um, but I think more and more as you look at medical education positions at academic institutions, chairs are wanting to see that you have some sort of training in that, whether it's a medical education fellowship, which can be one to two years, there's a lot of variety in those, um, a master's in medical education, although that's probably less common than, um, than what most people have these days, or even just some sort of course training, like a medical education research course at a conference, or something like the ASAP teaching fellowship. There's a lot of different options out there where you can get kind of a focused, like here's a formal overview of what you need to do to be an educator, both in administrative aspects and research and curriculum development. Um, and in terms of me, I had exposure to emergency medicine prior to medical school. Um, I actually worked as a social worker and I was on the midnight shift in the emergency department and I loved it. So I, I had an inkling going into medical school but kept an open mind. I think that's really important. And um, just kind of listen to your inner voice about what, what you find most appealing and, and uh, as Dr. Dubash indicated, you know that you're eager to go to and, and not looking to, you know, looking at the time as the day goes by. Um, and then in terms of research, some of the challenges that you can certainly anticipate are um, papers rejected and grants not funded. 
when you come to a meeting like this, you see all these people and it can be a little bit intimidating when they talk about, well, they have this grant funded and there's all these different publications, but for all of the publications and grants that they are talking about, there are many uh, that were rejected or unfunded. So it's a matter of, you know, having the persistence to continue. And I think one nice thing, when you think about research, you may think, well, I'm just doing a small project with a faculty mentor. But in general, when you come to a meeting like this and you see, you know, 3,500 people who are all working to improve the specialty, you can see that those incremental efforts really do move the needle. Um, so that's one thing that uh, certainly an upside in comparison uh, to some of the downsides. Uh, hi. Uh, so regarding the, um, the informatics fellowship, um, is there kind of a role for people with no coding background or would that make it a little more difficult to, to navigate, I guess? Uh, so clinical informatics um, has uh, um, a lot of different areas that it touches. So it's got to do with, uh, you know, health information exchange, interoperability. It's got to do with sort of the user experience of people interacting with, uh, with EHRs. Um, it's got to do with, um, you know, sort of taking the, the information in the EHR and leveraging it for sort of higher purposes. Uh, going into quality data registries or being able to do population health. And most of the informatics fellowships don't require any sort of coding background whatsoever. Um, and, and actually a big component of the informatics fellowship is all about change management because the, the reason that problems haven't been solved and things haven't been optimized isn't for a lack of techno technology to solve the problems. It has to do with being able to work with all the various teams and stakeholders within the hospital uh, to build a consensus to make the changes that are, that are necessary. And so there are some programs where it's sort of very coding heavy, um, but there's, there's a big variety uh, because informatics fellowships can be sponsored through multiple different uh, departments. So there's uh, four informatics fellowships that are within departments of emergency medicine but um, there's a lot more that are available through uh, you know, pathology or family medicine or a lot of other specialties and they generally accept applicants from, uh, from any specialty background and during the fellowship you'd get to work in the emergency department part of the time and then you'd also have an opportunity to rotate um, through the different uh, health IT teams within the, within the system to learn about security and billing and coding and um, you know, documentation improvement efforts, and so you definitely don't have to have uh, a coding background to, to do an informatics fellowship. Good morning. Um, this question's for Dr. DeBosch. Um, over here. <laughs> Hi. Um, so kind of as you mentioned, doing a fellowship in something is sort of becoming a prerequisite for getting a job in an academic emergency department. I've kind of noticed that trend in the departments that I'm familiar with. So would you say that if you find yourself at the end of your residency and you're not sure if you um, want to teach in the future or if you have any, ind any inkling that you might want to teach in the future but you're not sure if you want to do a fellowship, does that kind of close doors for you if you don't pursue a fellowship in something? And then kind of a second question is that I've heard that if you deviate from the academic world, it's really hard to come back. So what are the options for people that maybe go work in the private world for a while and then maybe want to teach later in their career? Yeah, good question. Um, I think you're right. I think a lot of academic jobs now want you to have this niche and have some sort of training in it, whether it's you know ultrasound, toxicology, informatics, medical education. Um, it is not absolutely necessary or required. I think nowadays it is you're going to be a more appealing candidate if you do have that. Um, if you just want to teach, and I, I tell this to m residents who come to me and say, I want to teach, don't know if I want to do all the publications, academic stuff, um, I don't think you need to do a fellowship for that. 
you can get a job at an institution that's affiliated with a medical school where you have rotators and just do your bedside teaching. Um, it is certainly possible if you go work in the community to come back later and do a medical education fellowship. I have a number of colleagues who have done that. Probably less common than people who just decide from the get-go I want to be in academics and start that, but it is absolutely not impossible to do community and then decide, you know, three, five, ten years out um, that you want to come back and pursue academics. Um, our first full professor in my department, who's our vice chair of our department, actually worked in the community for ten plus years, decided he wanted to do academics, came back, made a name for himself, published a lot, got promoted pretty quickly. Um, so it's certainly possible. You can always in your career go back from one to the other. And again, if you do community first and you go to a place where they're going to want to see your track record for promotion, you're going to have to get back into it and start producing scholarly activity, but it's certainly, certainly doable. Um, Dr. Juru, uh, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, I'm sorry. Um, in terms of the administration fellowships, what can a rising fourth year um, medical student do to either explore his interest in that or um, kind of make himself more appealing to those fellowships kind of down the road? Um, or maybe what they're looking for, I guess, in your experience? You said my name perfectly. Um, so I guess in terms of ways to get involved early on, um, you know, every emergency department has a medical director and uh, depending upon the, the volume of the emergency department, the administrative team may be, may be more specialized than that. There may be someone who specifically does operations or someone who specifically does quality. And um, you know, these people are always looking for residents and students who are interested uh, in doing projects. and. Um, one of the things that I've tried to do is in addition to, you know, uh, recognizing all of the opportunities for improvement everywhere in the department is not only fixing those, but I think that you can make uh, operations a scholarly activity too. So you can sort of measure how is the department performing, um, you know, related to a certain issue that you see, um, implement uh, uh, an intervention, and then you can see did we actually achieve the, the change that we were hoping, hoping to do? And so, you know, I think that probably finding that, that medical director or someone who, who does operations within the departments that you're rotating in, I think they'd be more than happy to, to talk to you about the different projects uh, that they have, uh, have available. Hi, thank you all for giving us your time. Um, I know that one of the things that appeals to me about emergency medicine is that it's so sort of intimately tied in with public health. Um, and I can sort of understand how in your careers you've been able to trade off a little bit of the clinical time to do education or admin or research. Um, for some of the things that are more programmatic um, in nature within the world of public health, um, whether that's a role in state or local government, um, or uh, when it comes to global health, if you want to work for a nonprofit organization or a humanitarian organization, how can you balance that um, with academic medicine? Because it seems like on the one hand, um, the institution wants you to be productive for them, but on the other hand, um, the institution is also what provides you with a lot of the connections and the resources to be able to do some of those things. Thank you. You know, so I think the, one of the cool things about emergency medicine is you can sort of like build whatever career that, that you want to do. Um, you know, there's a certain set of core fellowships that everybody sort of recognizes. Um, but uh, I know that there's resources available to you guys through the RAMS roadmaps that sort of talk about your career paths. And there's also an EMRA fellowship guide. And I was sort of amazed when I looked in the table of contents of there. I think there were like 30 or 40 like pathways that are sort of defined that you could do after, after your training. And so you can really build whatever type of experience that, that you want. So, um, you know, I know emergency physicians who work as consultants for different levels of government, or some people ultimately decide to become entirely non-clinical, and there's emergency physicians who have leadership positions within the CDC or other government organizations. And so you've got a lot of flexibility with your clinical schedule 
and it's sort of up to your imagination in terms of being able to build the, the future that you want, so long as you've got someone that's willing to, you know, pay you for your time or pay what you're doing, because you've got you to be able to pay the bills. Um, but I think within, within that, you've got a ton of, ton of flexibility. Yeah, I think that's one of the great things about emergency medicine. You don't have your own practice where you have to be accountable for everything. In most cases, you're working for a group or you're working for a hospital. And there's so much variability. It's pretty much, I think, it's, it's possible to find a place that's going to support what you want to do. Um, you know, full-time emergency medicine community is about 14 to 15 shifts a month, give or take. Um, academics, I think there's a lot more flexibility, and as long as you're doing something that's, you know, you're going to be able to still keep up your clinical skills if you want to work clinically and be able to do whatever and other endeavor you want, I think it, it's certainly possible to find a department that will support that. I have a colleague from residency who works for the CDC. She gets deployed all over the world whenever there's an epidemiological outbreak, and she works about one to two shifts a month clinically at a community hospital in Atlanta that's affiliated with the university. Um, I have other colleagues who have run for public office, still able to work clinically here and there, and that can change over the course of the year. You can say, you know what, this month I'm not going to be here, um, as long as your group supports it. Um, but be, being able to pursue those other endeavors that are related to public health and global health. I agree with everything that's been said, and I definitely think that you can structure and create the career you want uh, based on your interests, because I, uh, much like the other panelists, have friends at the American Heart Association, CDC, federal government, people who are traveling frequently overseas uh, for wilderness medicine and international health and global health opportunities. So you can... Uh, structure it any way you like. Maybe time for just one more question. Um, so this is a question, I guess, for all of you. Um, looking at emergency medicine programs, if you know you want to go into academics after resident, or if you want a career in academics, three or four year programs, is there a pro and con one way or the other? Um, so, Yes and no. So I went to a three-year program. Um, I think the, the only caveat about a three versus four-year program is that if you go to a three-year program and you want to get a job at an academic institution that has a four-year residency, there's a lesser chance they're going to hire you right off the bat because you would be the same PGY level is their senior residents. Um, that being said, I have a friend who did that. So it's possible. I think they've you know, shown that there's no higher likelihood of doing a fellowship if you come from a three or four year program. And I think a lot of people end up doing fellowships anyways. Um, again, I went to a three year program, so maybe I'm a little bit biased, but I don't think it held me back at all in getting to where I wanted to do because I did a fellowship right after training and then was, you know, a, I could apply for pretty much any job I wanted at that time. I went to a four-year program, so four-year programs are the best. Uh, <laughs> um, I think that in addition to sort of the, the staffing issues that you have to think about um, in terms of resident supervision as a, as a fellow, um, the, a lot of four-year programs also have scholarly tracks that are built into them, so if you're sort of contemplative about a fellowship but you haven't really sort of made that decision uh, or if you are applying for sort of a very competitive fellowship type uh, that the four-year program also has a lot more elective time has scholarly tracks and so uh, you can sort of explore that area a little bit more during residency um, and build like a portfolio of work that may help your fellowship application um, and uh, I think a lot of uh, four-year programs um, also have, have things that are built into them, so maybe you, if you're able to build this portfolio of work and expertise during residency training, then maybe you don't, don't need to do the fellowship depending upon sort of the robustness of the, the scholarly tracks that are available at those residency programs. Um, Zach and I trained at the same program, so I also went to a four-year program. Um, I would say that it offered the opportunity, just as he indicated, to explore more options. You know, there were uh, overseas opportunities, there were, um, you know, opportunities within Colorado that we were able to explore different ways to 
find out what was right for you. So it was a great opportunity to sort of sample the buffet and then still be able to make a decision at the end and offered opportunities for research and uh, potentially some national leadership involvement in academic activities uh, during, res uh, during residency training. Um, Zach was incrementally involved with EMRA and maybe can speak a little bit to how that helped him. So um, one of the things that I knew that I wanted to do as a medical student was be on the EMRA board and so specifically targeted programs with lots of elective time and um, you know for all the similarities between three and four year programs there's just not as much elective time at, at three year programs and so that was one of the things that, that drew me there uh, and also when I was on the interview trail I was talking to program directors about wanting to have national leadership positions during residency and made sure that they would be supportive of that if I were to uh, to match there um, and and pretty much everyone said said yes as long as you're doing well clinically so I think that that's that's the really really important is there's all these different career options and ways to get involved but if you're not clinically excellent then no one's going to take you serious in any of these other roles and so um, that's where you got to start and then you can add this other stuff on top of it I think one thing I will say when looking at residency programs look at the overall program if there's a four-year program look at what are they going to actually offer you in those four years is it just you know you're going to get eight months of ICU time and not as much elective time um, there are three-year programs with elective time where you can go and pursue things like global health or you know away rotations um, so I think really just look at what that extra year is going to offer you it's certainly possible in a three-year program as well to join committees and to do research. Most of our residents do. Um, it's a little bit shorter of a time frame to figure out what you want to do, but it's certainly not going to, I don't think, close many doors for you. In, in summary, just one more question for the panelists. Just a quick, maybe practical piece of advice you could give to um, our medical students who are interested. Is there a program, a conference, a curriculum? Jody, you mentioned the Cleveland Clinic but some experience that, that is available to medical students that would kind of give them a taste of the, the future career options in each of your fields? Sure. Um, so I did the Cleveland Clinic uh, summer program, but any research opportunity that you can engage in uh, would be wonderful. I mean, there's certainly more advanced fellowships, like the Howard Hughes Medical Institute has a summer fellowship as well. But if you're you know, more advanced in your medical school years, just doing a research project to have the experience and see if it's something you enjoy uh, would be really important. And then you're already doing things right by coming to a meeting like this where you have exposure uh, both to educational didactics but to research and, and see if that's something that piques your interest. Yeah, and I would say just talk to people. You know, Dr. Cass mentioned in her last talk, just go up to people and pick their brains. Ask them what their day-to-day -day job is like. Ask them what the pros and the cons are because there are so many different options within EM, and I don't think you're going to find one person who has this exact same job as somebody else. So just don't be afraid to make those connections, especially at meetings like this. There are so many great minds and leaders in EM doing all different avenues. Um, so just go up and talk to these people and pick their brains. Uh, I second everything that's been said. Uh, everybody that's in academic emergency medicine is here because we love teaching and we love mentoring. And so we're all, all available to, to help you. Um, I know that uh, one of the approaches I took as a medical student is I was really active on Twitter and started following people and uh, started having online conversations with them. And, uh, you know, when it was time for a big national conference, I would say, hey, can we go grab coffee or chat? And everyone was more than, than uh, you know, very gracious and, uh, and shared their time with me. And then I think in terms of uh, sort of looking at all of the different fellowship options that, that are available, I think the, the best resource I've seen is that EMRA fellowship guide where they've got these, like, dozens of opportunities and these really niche fellowship types that I, I'd never even heard of until I looked at the table of, of contents. So it really highlights um, sort of the diversity of options that you have, have available. Okay, thank you guys so much. Great. Thanks, guys. Round of applause for our panel. Yeah.